Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Looks like uh, Neil is coming in five by there. Uh, 11, uh, Mike, see you in the background. If you don't believe that humans ever landed on the moon, you'd probably think that on July 16, 1969, a select group of government officials, a crew of filmmakers sworn to secrecy, and a famed Hollywood director named Stanley Kubrick all gathered on a soundstage in a military base, deep in the Nevada desert, better known as Area 51. And here, they pulled off the greatest hoax in history. You'd probably think that astronauts, or should I say actors, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and Michael Collins fled this rocket through a secret passageway just before it took off for space, totally empty. And you would have to believe that the estimated 400,000 people who were involved in this mission were in on it, all promising to take this secret to their grave. 22% of Americans either don't believe that we landed on the moon or harbor some doubt. To advance the technology of space flight. We looked at the tapes and the countless photos. We talked to astrophysicists, meteorologists, and NASA historians to better understand the moon landing conspiracy, how it started, what hoaxers use as their evidence, and what this belief teaches us about why some conspiracies are so enduring. Armstrong is on the moon. Neil Armstrong standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. All right, so to give you some context on the moon landing, I need to briefly explain World War II and the Cold War, which is something I've kind of done a lot on this channel. So instead of me doing it again, we hired someone with an old timey, like radio transatlantic accent to do it instead. Buckle up for this one. In a world on the brink of destruction, the United States of America joined the Allied forces in the Second World War in 1941. The Big Three, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and now the USA versus the Axis powers, Italy, Japan, and Nazi Germany. They sure did put up a fight, but the Allied powers came out on top, you see. But then America and the USSR got real cold with each other. A tragic reversal of the old tales of enemies turned lovers. The communists found the United States to be exceedingly aggressive and quite trigger-happy with all their new military power, meddling in things they ought to be keeping their noses out of. Across the pond, the capitalist United States was fearful that the USSR was hankering to spread their communism across the whole globe. The war remained cold only because both powers had thousands of the most deadly weapons humanity had ever seen and wouldn't dare use them against each other. It was something of a horrifying stalemate. Soon, the empires turned to other feats of strength. Psychological warfare, spying, sports, proxy wars, and a race to advance their technologies. And to top it all, a race like no other. A race to space, space, space. At first, it is very clear that the Soviets are winning the race. They're launching dogs and plants into space and bringing them back alive. They send up satellites that orbit the moon and take photos of the far side that no one had seen before. They even put a human up into space to orbit around the entire Earth. The first space flight would be made by a Soviet man. The U.S. needs to catch up, so President Eisenhower creates a brand new government agency dedicated entirely to space. And they eventually start to send up satellites and even people, but they don't get someone to orbit the entire Earth like the Russians did. Womp womp, the U.S. is losing the space race. And this is where JFK gets up in front of the nation and declares that the U.S. is setting a goal. In this decade, we shall make up and move ahead. He's declaring what would surely be the ultimate finish line in this global race for power. We choose to go to the moon in this decade. An American astronaut eventually orbits the Earth. Not because they are easy. Russia then puts the first woman in space while also getting the first person to walk in space. But because they are hard. The NASA teams are pulling all-nighters year after year, trying to figure out how they're going to make good on JFK's big promise to somehow get a man on the moon by the end of the decade. 
Things are heating up. Time is running out. And then... NASA's disaster was a major setback, but the stakes were too high to give up. The space race had become much more than a technological rivalry. Winning the race to the moon would mean winning the ideological war for the world. Would it be communism or capitalism? They couldn't give up now, so they kept going. In 1968, NASA finally gets a spaceship, the Apollo 8, to orbit the moon with astronauts aboard. There's hope. Russia is able to exchange a crew in space. For both sides, a moon trip suddenly seems within reach. But who will get there first? I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. And then, after hundreds of millions of dollars, and countless focused hours by the country's brightest minds, comes a morning on a summer day in Houston, Texas in 1969. 10, 10. Three men buckle up. Nine. Hundreds of millions of people around the world find themselves glued to their television sets because the greatest achievement of mankind might happen. Then starts the five, four, four three, three, two, two one. Zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Roll complete and a pitch is program. The rocket heads towards the finish line, that pearly orb that humans have stared at and mythologized about, fixated on, and they're finally going to touch it. Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Four days and 200,000 miles later, it's July 20th, 1969, months before JFK's deadline was up. Two of the three astronauts disconnect from the orbiting ship and descend onto the moon's surface, and then... There you go. Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. It really is. Oof. These fumes. The race had clearly been won. A line had been crossed, not just for the global superpower who did this, but for all humans who had just taken their obsession for exploration to new heights. But right away after this event, even though it was broadcast on live television for the whole world to see, there were rumblings of doubt. About a year after the landing, you start to see newspaper articles casting doubt that any of this actually happened. Two years after the landing, we see James Bond running away from a bunch of security guards through the Nevada desert when he somehow stumbles upon a secret moon landing film set, resulting in this moon buggy car chase thing through the desert. It was all a tongue-in-cheek reference to this budding conspiracy that the whole thing was faked. A few years later, a former U.S. Navy officer and Apollo rocket technical writer comes out with this book. I think it was an intuitive feeling that what was being shown was not real. The book is a long evaluation of evidence that claims that we never actually went to the moon. This book makes the case that the moon landing was so political that the U.S., having failed to develop a feasible plan to get to the moon, pulled off this secretive staging of the event, all as a propaganda play to get ahead of the Soviets. And he emphasizes the point that, you know, it's the Cold War, it's not that far-fetched that the U.S. government would come up with some deception campaign in the name of beating communism, which is like totally fair actually. But that's not evidence, that's just speculation. He does go on to present a bunch of photos and explanations that turn into the foundation of what would become a widespread theory that the moon landing was faked. The lunar landings were more than likely fabricated. Why wouldn't the moon landing be faked? You know, why wouldn't we fake that? We did not land men on the moon. The moon? 
Jones. Yeah, it's fake. And I would bet my life on it. This is actually the reason I wanted to make this video, is I wanted to understand what the foundation of this conspiracy theory actually was. The people who truly earnestly believe it, what do they think happened here? I'm not going to go through all of the evidence and theories here because they're kind of all over the place, but let me show you some of the major ones. The first major one starts here. How come there aren't any stars in this photo? There's no atmosphere or light pollution on the moon. Shouldn't this photo look like this? Well, it turns out that if you want to capture the stars, even on the moon, you have to open up your camera for a very long time and let a bunch of light in. Trust me, I know this because I spent months of my life trying to photograph a galaxy and I learned a lot about how not to photograph stars. And let me just tell you, it's it's a lot harder than it looks. When I was doing that, I was opening up my shutter for 30 seconds and I took hundreds of images just to get this one shot. So when you're on the bright moon and you're trying to photograph a bunch of guys in bright white reflective suits, you're not opening up your shutter for a very long time. You're not letting in a bunch of light. There's basically no chance of getting a decent shot of the stars in this environment. But you get something. I mean, if you take the photo and blast up the brightness, you can kind of see some traces of the stars if you really need to do that. Okay, but what about these shadows? Some of these shadows go this way and some go this way. Shouldn't the shadows be parallel if they're all coming from one source, the sun? Yes, the only light source in this photo is the sun. But you have to remember that light bounces off things, especially white things. So you have light bouncing off of lots of different surfaces, which is one reason the shadows look a little weird. Oh, and remember that you're looking at light that was filtered through a lens. A camera lens distorts the direction of things depending on how wide or tight it is. Okay, but what about this flag? This flag is waving, but there's no wind on the moon. Yes, the flag is kind of waving. But remember that this isn't a normal flag. NASA had to make a custom flag for the Apollo missions that had a horizontal rod right up here so that the flag wouldn't look like this. It had to look nice and American and patriotic. You had to be able to see it. So when the astronauts were sticking the flag in the lunar soil, the motion of that movement caused the material to move and it kind of looks like it's wavy. Okay, but look how they're moving. This is so unnatural. It's almost like they're being pulled up by a wire. Oh, and look, did you catch that? That looks like a wire. Okay, wait, just confession here. I was watching all of these conspiracy documentaries like while we we're doing this story and they're like incredibly tantalizing. This is the one that actually kind of got me. I was like, wait a minute, they are moving really weird. The motion is so off kilter. It looks like they're being like dragged by a wire. So to figure this out, we actually talked to a physicist and a meteorologist who helpfully explained just how different life in one sixth Earth's gravity is. I mean, think about it. Our intuition for everything we know is calibrated to Earth's gravity. It's everything we've ever known. It's how our brains interpret the world. It's how our muscles calibrate to the world. So when you're watching these videos of these astronauts in suits that weigh 180 pounds, clunking around with their Earth gravity trained muscles on the moon, you see some really weird movements. But I mean, who knows? Maybe the two scientists we talked to are actually in on it. Maybe they're some of the half million Americans who were paid by the government to keep the hoax alive. Also that we could feel like America is better than the Soviet Union in 1969. Maybe, could be. Okay, listen, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these theories. There's a lot of evidence out there. Like why isn't there exhaust on this flame? Or why did the Eagle Lander not leave a crater? What about the radiation exposure that these astronauts would have gotten? What about Neil Armstrong's boot print? Or the lost tapes? Don't get me started on the lost tapes. We actually had a whole section in the script about the lost tapes and ultimately it didn't make the cut. Now listen, I want it to be clear that you should not be ashamed if you actually want answers to these questions, especially in a time where all of us are kind of renegotiating our relationship with trust in governmental institutions. But I will tell you that after earnestly looking into this stuff, none of the presented evidence comes anywhere close to the burden of proof and evidence I would need to see to believe that the moon landing was a hoax. I will put resources in our source doc of the many instances of astrophysicists and scientists walking you through all this stuff, I think it's useful to look at. Before we move on with our story of the conspiracy theory, let me use this moment to say a word about human neurology and visual information, something I think about a lot. For me, when I sit through the evidence-based debunk on these theories, which is something we did for this story, it helps me understand the limits of human senses 
Our eyes and ears and logical thinking brains were optimized for very different problems than evaluating the physics of our fellow homo sapiens jumping around on a baby planet 200,000 miles away. Like, we're not set up for this stuff. Going through the conspiracy theory and then going through the debunks reminds me why we as a species developed other ways of sensing, other ways of measuring and knowing things about the world, other tools that aren't as intuitive to us, but that extend our power to know things that are real, that are true. If you don't lean on these tools, in other words, if you don't look to science in your evaluation and instead rely on your optic nerve feeding grainy pixels into your great ape brain, I think we can all agree that you'll take for truth things that are not true. Okay, neurology section is over. Let's get back to it. If you're going to go down this rabbit hole and indulge your conspiracy mind like I did for this story, let's talk about what people think actually happened here. Like, all of this footage and all of these photos, what do the moon hoaxers think we're looking at? One of the most common explanations is that the U.S., afraid that they would be embarrassed in front of the global stage because they would fail on JFK's big promise, hired a famed Hollywood director, Stanley Kubrick, who had just released a groundbreaking space movie, and they used his visual skills to deceive the world, filming the moon landing on a soundstage in the middle of the desert. I mean, look, this rock has a perfect C on it. Is that a prop? These misaligned shadows, they explain as studio lights. The flag was waving because there was air conditioning in the studio, and these photos were actually taken by Stanley Kubrick's crew. All of these movements, they say, were done with wires and slow motion. And that black starless sky is just a black cloth backdrop. That's one small step for man. In 1977, the conspiracy theory had spread enough that NASA had to come out and issue a fact sheet responding to the claims, the first sentence of which is just, yes, astronauts did land on the moon. But then a movie comes out in 1977 about the government faking a space mission, this time to Mars, to save face to the American people. But the space race was over. It wasn't the focus anymore. And eventually, so was the Cold War. This moon landing theory became more and more fringe. But inevitably, like any other good tantalizing conspiracy theory, it was eventually repackaged and put into one of these really spooky, cheesy cable news documentaries. In 2001, Fox News aired this documentary. On conspiracy theory, did we land on the moon? It was basically just a repackaging of all the old theories, but for a new audience. But now it was the dawn of the internet age, and NASA had to respond to this Fox News doc by reissuing the fact sheet that they issued in 1977, but this time on a website. An innocent foreshadow to combating information on the internet. They had no idea what was coming. The doc gave the conspiracy new energy, new followers. And soon, a conspiracy theorist was following Buzz Aldrin around a hotel, pestering him and demanding him to swear on the Bible that he landed on the moon. And Buzz punched him in the face. Shortly after that, a French mockumentary came out, laying out evidence that Stanley Kubrick did film the moon landing. The problem is people thought it was real. There's a fake documentary, not a real documentary, but a fake like a mockumentary where he's admitting and people are talking about. Uh -huh. Have you seen that one? No, but that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, the, a lot of people are like, dude, you didn't even know there's an actual real <laughs> interview with him where he admits that he faked the moon landing. Uh -huh. But it's not. Yeah. It's just, it's fake. So today, the conspiracy lives on in a world of increasing science skepticism and on an internet that fuels pretend information, and to a demographic that is more and more mistrusting of institutional knowledge. One poll found that in 2019, 11% of American millennials believed that the moon landing was staged. It's become a particularly durable conspiracy theory because it has all of the ingredients of a good conspiracy theory. It's shadowy government antagonist with political motives, it leans on the human eye and brain as the primary measuring tool for the evidence. And when you believe in stuff like this, it feels good, like you're in on a secret. So let me just end this video by telling you why I know we landed on the moon. On the moon, on the moon, on the moon. You are looking at a very thin section of moon rock, magnified 500 times. 
First off, we brought back 900 pounds of rocks during the Apollo missions. The Soviets, who were our technological and geopolitical enemies, eventually sent a robot to the moon to collect samples of their own. These precious rocks are sent out to scientists and educators 400 times a year to be studied and examined. And it has been verified by a lot of different people who have no motive to lie that these rocks were developed in an environment completely rid of oxygen. Also, the Soviets themselves corroborated the moon landing and acknowledged that it happened. I mean, the Soviet leader kind of begrudgingly complimented the US and they published like a tiny little blurb in one of their newspapers, but like, they lost and they admitted they lost. Also, if I'm gonna rely on just my human brain logic for a second here, Think about it, there were hundreds of thousands of people who were involved in the Apollo missions. Scientists, engineers, physicists, policymakers, mathematicians, all working day and night towards this goal, obsessing over every detail and then monitoring every step of the way, from Houston, Texas, to the surface of the moon and back, communicating with the astronauts the whole time. So imagine two Texas Motor Speedway stadiums full of the brightest minds in the country, all in on the biggest deception of all time without a single leak. And finally, if you insist on using your eyeballs as your only sensors that you will accept as proof, just look at this. This photo was taken by a telescope orbiting the moon. These are astronaut and buggy tracks here on the surface of the moon. You can even see the buggy's parking spot right here. And if you think that this photo, that yes, was originally taken by NASA, but many other photos have come out by other space stations that show physical evidence of the humans on the moon. If you think that this is still the government, like 40 years later, the kids and grandkids of the Apollo people still photoshopping pictures to keep up this elaborate ruse, I don't know what would convince you. Thanks for watching. Um, this was a fun video to work on and we have so much archive. Like luckily there's amazing footage for this and we got to use a teaspoon of it for this, but really we'll put some links in the description and in the source doc for a place you can go to look at all of this amazing footage and photography. I want to quickly tell you about the newsroom, which is our Patreon, where all of you support the journalism we're doing here. You can go to the newsroom and get access to a behind the scenes vlog that we do every month. So it is a, an insight into everything we do here. You can meet the team, you can see the process of how we are building this um, journalism studio on YouTube. Uh, you also get access to my scripts, you get access to Tom Fox music that you can use royalty free, and it's just a way that you can support the journalism we're trying to do here. You also can check out the new poster that we just launched. It is called All Maps Are Wrong. I designed it with the help of some of my friends, and um, it is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. It has all of the map projections that are the way that we take the Earth, which is a sphere, and put it onto a flat plane, which is called a map. And in doing so, you stretch the map inevitably, and it means that all maps are wrong. And this poster is kind of an homage to that. We have LUTs and presets, which is how we color our photos and videos. And we recently launched a tip line, a place where we can hear from you on what stories you think we should tell, whether you have access to specific data or evidence or knowledge that you think would make a compelling story or an investigation that needs to be done or just a story that you think is undercovered and that needs um, explanation. Information about that is in the description. We always love to hear from you to make our reporting more holistic, more representative and stronger. So thank you for your submissions. Thank you all for being here. I will see you in the next one.